Everybody, thank you so much for joining today. My name is Olga Bolotina. I am the chair of the San Francisco Bay chapter of the Sierra Club. And we started the series in the know to introduce you to amazing, amazing environmental um, activists in the Bay Area and beyond who are making our Bay Area incredible. And I'm very, very excited to introduce you today to Arthur Feinstein, who has been my colleague for many years. And I'm excited to learn much more about him today. Um, Arthur is single-handedly, um, well, single we don't do anything in isolation, but Arthur just highlight, he's been a specialist in wetlands and he started activism, Arthur correct me during the interview if I'm wrong, but um, started his activism in, at the Golden Gate Audubon Society. And he has been instrumental to protect wetlands around the Bay, which not only wetlands, but also it includes the, the uh, Bay Trail that we all enjoy. So I want to highlight that um, everything, uh, all the environments, all the parks, all the wetlands and that nature that we have around the bay are preserved thanks to people like Arthur. So I want to highlight the Martin Luther King the shoreline, Junior Ridge Wetland, Burrhead Marsh, Bear Island in Redwood City, Don Edwards San Francisco Bay National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, so it's thousands of acres of of pristine lands that have been either protected or restored, thanks to Arthur. Arthur, I really appreciate you. So after Audubon Society, he, uh, which you were um, for 15 years, you worked as a as an executive director, and then Arthur moved to Sierra Club volunteer, which I really appreciate because Arthur is very actionable. He is always very determined. Right now, he is chairing the conservation of the Sierra Club California, which sets um, priorities and um, and policies for California. So Arthur, without further ado, thank you so, so much for joining me today, for making the time. I know you were very busy. You just talked yesterday that you're jumping from one call to another, all for Sierra Club, and uh, to make sure that all of our big ideas are moving forward. So, Thank you. And I wanted to just start, where did you grow up? How, how, how your childhood went and what particular things sort of maybe led you to be so concerned about the environment and nature? So. Well, hi, Olga, thanks. And thanks for having me on. Um, and that was a very flattering introduction. <laughs> well deserved. I not do anything by myself. It's always with tons of people working on all of these efforts. Um, so when I grew up, um, I was born in the Bronx in New York City, and then we moved out to Long Island, one of the first Levitt suburbs of Levittown. It was still being built when we moved out there. Um, and both my parents were teachers. And so once they got their feet on the ground, and I was starting to be around 10 or 11, I guess. We started every summer traveling around the country, camping at national parks. When I was 13, I wrote the National Park Service asking for a job. They told me I was too young. I was upset. Uh, <laughs> but that started me, uh, I guess, I'm sure, on appreciating nature and, and what's there. Uh, when I went to college, it was uh, in Portland, Oregon, and uh, there's a lot of nature out there, especially when I was there. We'd go up to the Olympic National Park and have wonderful sort of wilderness experiences there. So I've, I've been pretty much immersed in nature one way or the other all my life. And... Um, and my parents were very interested in nature. They were more interested in plants. I became more interested in critters. But, you know, it all works together. Right. And, <laughs> <laughs> right. And um, after college, I, I taught school for a year in uh, Ocean Hill, Brownsville, which was the uh, Brooklyn equ equivalent of Harlem. And... Uh, to the east coast. Pardon? 
You went back to the East Coast. Went back to the East Coast and taught school for a year. This was uh, Vietnam War teachers were exempt from uh, getting drafted for a while. So I'd gone back to, uh, to teach. And it was a very interesting experience in middle school. Uh, at the time, that was a community that was seeking social equity way in advance. This was 68, uh, 1968. Uh, and they had uh, their own board of education that they decided uh, they needed to be more aggressive in getting African-American teachers for their kids. This was a, like I said, equivalent to Harlem, basically an African-American community. Very, very poor, lots of drugs. Um, and the school boards uh, wanted to bring in these new teachers and they, uh, <laughs> uh, the teacher union went on strike against them and my school year was spent with cops around our school and uh, it was a very interesting experience. I really got to uh, understand socially e social equity issues mm -hmm. pretty darn well. It was quite sad what those kids were going through and how they lived their lives. It was, it was tough. Uh, but it was educational for me, but at the end of one year, I said, that's enough. I came out to California, San Francisco, and... Uh, what were you uh, teaching? What I taught you? science. I was a biology major and had a good grounding in science, and I taught science in middle school. Um, and came out to San Francisco, was a musician for around 10 years. And then, <laughs> yeah. Did you play? I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, flute and sax, mostly jazz and Latin jazz. Oh, wow. Um, and top 40 when I guess. I hope you have some recordings that we can share. <laughs> that would be awesome. And then I was a part-time muni operator when music disappeared for around 12 years. And during that time, I got married. My wife was my librarian up the hill from me in Potrero Hill in San Francisco. And she was in the Audubon Society. And this was when uh, Reagan was president and he had James Watt as Secretary of the Interior, who said, you know, Armageddon is coming down. We're going to just, the apocalypse is coming. So just trash the environment now, use it up. And uh, there was an outpouring of protests, not unsimilar to where we are now. And uh, since my wife was already in the Audubon Society, I gravitated there. and. Joined the Audubon, got active in their conservation committee, and ultimately was their president and then executive director and did a lot of environmental work, mostly on wetlands. Um, and that's sort of my trajectory for getting into the environmental uh, community. Wow. So any, any I'm, I want to go back a little bit to this childhood is such a formative time for all of us. And it seems like your parents played a huge role in your upbringing and, and getting you to love nature. Any particular story of, with critters or plants? Well, uh, not anything particular. I mean, we did actually go just about to every national park over those six years during the summer. And um, nothing really stands out except uh, how stupid I can be around a campfire where I tried to lift up this thing, this stone that was what we were cooking on and burnt both my hands. Um, that was a learning experience. So now I am uh, a little more alert when we're out camping, but nothing spectacular except, you know, when you're in national parks, it's just spectacular. Yeah, I remember, you know, at uh, one of the moments here, I, I traveled with my father to Yosemite, Yosemite, Yellowstone, actually, through Yosemite. And we uh, drove sort of on the, on the road up the hill. We looked at the meadow, which was not I hearing a little echo, so I hope it disappears. Um, I, with the naked eye, you cannot see anything at all. And then there were scientists looking, uh, starting wolves actually, and oh. they were looking at a huge magnifying you know, telescope. It was amazing. You look in the picture and you see the wolf and the fox walking. It was just a whole 
Edo came alive. So that was that was very exciting for me. Yes. So so um, so you 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 came to California for uh, uh, continuing to study, or what was the? Uh, no, that was just to uh, basically escape that really depressing year of teaching in a very sad community and um, any any particular nuggets that you took away from that that because I know you are very active also in justice and inclusion work here and that's you know, a huge um, work that the Sierra Club is doing now so maybe you can this is some experience that very few people get especially that early on so some 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 things that stood out that you carried um, well, just how hard it is if you are raised in those communities to actually, you know, learn. I, I mean, I had kids falling asleep in class and, and I did have some kids who were on drugs already and they were like nine years old and, and um, it was just, well, yeah, nine, eleven. It was just, uh, you just get a sense of just how difficult life is when you're in a community where most people are poor, a lot of people living together. And, um, you know, uh, I mean, it's no secret about how difficult it is when you're living in a, um, a depressed community, a disadvantaged community. So um, I didn't really learn. I was... 19 years old, so <laughs> uh, I was easily distracted with other things too, but just that weight on you and the fact that we were in this unusual situation with the strike, with, um, you know, we would have our principal come and hold meetings saying, we know that we have no control over this school, but the kids don't, so don't tell them. I mean, it was that kind of situation. It was, it was a very, um, we were on the news, New York TV, you know, quite frequently. Um, eh, it was it was very odd. So uh, I I left just to get away from that. And uh, but I think it certainly has helped shape how I view society and and what needs to be done and and certainly how those communities need help without knowing what the answer is, how to help them. But certainly. Um, well, at 19 also, that, that's, that's uh, formative years for you. Also. So yeah. at 19, I think it's tough to make sense of a lot of things, especially things like that. So I totally understand it. And I think that what you're talking about is compassion and empathy. That yeah. we, you know, we, we a lot of times make assumptions about people, and I think it's very important to understand that we all come from different experiences and experiences shape us and sometimes it's very difficult to break away um, from from society so so um and we'll probably you know, talk because I, again i mentioned that the sierra club is doing a lot of work on inclusion and diversity and justice we want to make sure that um we reaching out um, and being of help to everybody to that make, uh, need help the most. And actually, I'm going to jump a little bit, but, but you work with wetland preservation and, and your work with um, um, adaptation to sea level rise. That uh, has a lot to do with, with just um, implementation of those programs. So do you want to explain that a little bit and sort of describe what, what your big vision is? Well, um, yeah, sea level rise in the Bay Area is uh, is a very difficult, <laughs> very difficult issue. Um, so, for folks who haven't dealt a lot with you know Bay Area aquatic environment um, and estuaries in general, and going back even further, San Francisco estuary is the largest estuary on the west coast of both continents, North and South America. It's one of the most productive aquatic ecosystems we have in terms of all kinds of wildlife, fish, invertebrates, and migratory worry birds. We have over a million shorebirds 
depending upon San Francisco's wetlands and mudflats every year, hundreds of thousands of waterfowl, ducks and geese, etc., as well as salmon and all kinds of fish species. Dungeness crab breed in San Francisco Bay, as well as on the coast, but a lot of them breed right inside the bay, and they use our shallow water habitats, mudflats, uh, tidal marshes, etc. And so it's an incredibly productive area that we benefit from as people and that sustains life in the ocean. It's all threatened by sea level rise because it only takes a foot of sea level rise to drown a tidal marsh. It just takes six inches to drown a mud flat. Uh, and deep water estuaries are much less productive and much less biodiverse than ones that have a lot of shallow water habitats like ours do. So sea level rise will be devastating to our aquatic environment in San Francisco Bay. It will just crash if we don't have these shallow water habitats. And so trying to figure out how to sustain them is really one of the major challenges we have over with sea level rise. And of course the other challenge in the sea level rise um, drastic numbers. Right? Oh yeah. I mean we are looking depending upon well, the numbers continue to get worse. <laughs> so, um, you know, originally they were talking about maybe half a foot to a foot uh, mm -hmm. by 2050. Now they're talking one and a half feet to three feet by 2050 and by 2100, as the Greenland starts melting and as the Antarctic, we keep reading, hearing more and more about how those uh, glaciers are starting to erode and melt. Um, I mean, people are not jokingly talking about six to 10 feet of sea level rise by 2100 or a little past, which is... That's a lot. I don't think any of us conceive of what that means. Uh, that's, that's a totally different world where um, the Bay Area will just be a different place. So that's one reason why we really have to constrain greenhouse gases and attack climate change, the climate crisis immediately, so we don't get up there. Mm -hmm. But they're already concluding, and the state's Office of uh, Ocean Protection Council has concluded by 2050, uh, no, even if we stopped, as we are doing right now, just complete production of greenhouse gases due to mm -hmm. no transportation and all that, uh, it's going to go up one to 1.5 feet regardless by 2050 and maybe more uh, just because of the amount of warming we've already had. So sea level rise is crucial and is critical to us. The Embarcadero in San Francisco is already underwater at high tides. Highway 37 was closed for six weeks. That's at the top of the bay. Uh, by flooding as a result of tides and heavy rains. In uh, Southern California, there are some communities that are already flooding from sea level rise on the coast. And in Pacifica, we have buildings falling into the ocean as a result of sea level rise. So uh, the impacts are already here, but the potential impacts are staggeringly frightening. And um, the Bay Conservation and Development Commission just came out with a study on potential impacts, and they talk about 80,000 homes being threatened by inundation, huge uh, 100 and some odd miles of our roads, 80, 101, 37, all being threatened with the Bay Touchdown, the Bay Bridge Touchdown is in Oakland, is already, if you go over that, drive over that, is at high king tides. You can see more. I'm talking about specific areas. Yeah, I'm talking about specific areas now in the Bay, um, The where the Bay Bridge touches down in Oakland, will be underwater in 2050, probably. And Caltrans is already trying to figure out what to do there. Uh, if not 2050, shortly after. So these impacts uh, that right that that show, um, and we might want to link those maps because I think that they're maps that show exactly sort of what happens with certain 
yes. uh, rise, how much, uh, how much of Oakland, how much of other uh, cities are flooded yes. um, when that happens. So I want to actually talk about the habitat and how much um, biodiversity lands and uh, the mud uh, um, floods pr uh, provide. A, I want to hear the, the difference between the two because quite frankly, I don't actually know that. So I just know I, I see a beautiful area with a, with a lot of birds usually <laughs> by, by Highway 37. That, that, that's, the, that's the really flat area right you know, in the level with the bay. Um, so what is the difference between those two and what do you do to water? Because that, that's the, the Crucial. Well, if you um, if you think about a bay shoreline, and here's your here's your shoreline, and it can go chum like that, and then you have a very steep, very deep water. But if you have a shoreline that goes down very slowly, mm -hmm. then at low tide there's a certain part of that shoreline that's going to be exposed for an X amount of time. Mm -hmm. And another element, a part of the shoreline close to the shore as it rises that is exposed, that is exposed to the air for a shorter, a longer amount of time. Mm -hmm. So mud flats are an area that are inundated. They're, mud flats are the, shallow water habitat that's furthest away from the shore, they're inundated most of the time. So you don't get any vegetation growing there, but for four or five hours a day, they're exposed to the air. And so in mudflats, you have an enormous amount of critters in the mudflats, worms, other invertebrates who can get air when it's exposed to the air but can live underwater. And uh, a cubic yard of mudflats has as much bioproductivity and critters as a cubic yard of a tropical forest. It's an incredibly rich area of life that we never see. You probably don't want to walk in the mud mudflats like you want to walk in. <laughs> right, and that's where you, Actually, you do see sometimes because if you're walking on a mudflat and you see little holes and little bubbles in it, there's a, probably an oyster or a clam or some other critter just underneath the surface that's breathing mm -hmm. and uh, causing these bubbles. So, um, so it is full of life and that's where shorebirds come and feed for uh, their migratory journey. They get to eat these uh, invertebrates and crustaceans as do some fish species, etc. So that's sort of like a crucial life part of the aquatic ecosystem. That's where a lot of the food is produced that critters higher up the food chain eat. As you go closer to the shore, you start getting vegetation and that's your tidal marsh. And tidal marsh vegetation is as productive as a tropical forest, yard for yard, cubic yard, uh, in producing oxygen and producing biomass. And uh, so oxygen, pretty important for us, mm -hmm. uh, for taking in impurities from the air. They do that as they breathe. They also clean our water, these tidal marsh vegetations. They attract pollutants and they bring it into the mud and they sequester it in the mud. And so it takes it out of the water environment. So it cleans our water. And uh, it provides a food base as it decays. Those critters out in the mudflats eat that decay material, you know, food chain kind of thing. So it all works together. Uh, all of it producing this incredible amount of life, which is the real thing. It's such a living area. And we see the fish and the birds, occasionally crabs and clams, but there's just a ton of other life there that is sustaining everything that lives in the bay and the ocean coming from these shallow water habitats. And I think we have some areas that are open, for, well, I'm not sure if they open now, but usually they open their walkways that you can, you can um, yeah. walk through, through those areas and see some of the critters because from like um, you know, just marshlands. <laughs> but um, I heard you mentioned 
that um, marshlands and, and um, tidal lands, they provide a lot of um, uh, the, the filtration for, for toxins, et cetera. And so I heard that a huge problem in pharmaceuticals, obviously, because a lot of them get disposed, you know, in the in toilets, et cetera. So then go into a, a water. Um, <coughs> So I heard that, that those ecosystems are the few ones that are able to filtrate the pharmaceuticals and also get rid of them through the micro, microorganisms. Those and re, 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 uh, absorb and get rid of them. So that was the part that I heard. I don't know if it's true or not. Or if it's interesting area yeah well they they are real important for cleaning up toxics and uh pollutants and possibly microorganisms they're doing a lot of studies on that now one of the adaptations that are being proposed for sea level rise are, are called living shorelines and one of those living shorelines is a type of things and and what they mean is again as this bay is rising, it's drowning these shallow water habitats. So scientists and, and are trying to figure out how do we preserve these shallow water habitats. And one way is to allow them to move inland as the water rises and the shoreline is a sh rises shallow uh, slowly. Then uh, we can allow the bay to move inland and create new mudflats and new uh, tidal marshes. Mm -hmm. Not so easy right in s places like San Francisco and Oakland and a lot of the Bay Area, we have housing right up to the shoreline where it's unlikely we're going to let tidal marshes go. But we do have quite a few areas in the North Bay where there's the opportunity to actually allow for uh, this marsh migration. Mm -hmm. Another tool is uh, this living shoreline tool where, for example, with beach, we can be creating beaches and what they do on some of them is they put logs out and other kind of structures that uh, as waves come in, they bring sediment. And then they come out and they can remove the sediment. But if you put things like logs, they can trap the sediment and you can help the beach grow as the ocean rises. Another way they're doing it is something called a horizontal levy, and this gets uh, more to it. This is something that the Oraloma Sanitary District, that's uh, sort of near Hayward, is investigating where what you would do is you would uh, create a levy where you think we need to stop the bay from approaching our where we live. But outboard of that bay, you would create a shallow water habitat from the top going down to the bay so that it's sort of allowing for, we bring in dredge material and other soils and raise the elevation of the bottom of the bay. So we're mimicking and creating these shallow water habitats anew. Mm -hmm. um, there's only been tried once or two places, I believe, but at this Oraloma Sanitary District, they done a similar thing, um, not into the bay, but upland from there, where they take their water that's gone through their clarifying process, their cleaning process, mm -hmm. and letting the water then drain through um, sediments that mimic mudflats and tidal marshes, where they have planted tidal marsh and uh, mudflat type vegetation, let the water percolate through, and then look how clean it is at the bottom and they're finding that it actually does remove a whole lot of pollutants and they think possibly even some of those ones that are in our chemicals that we put in our drugs and stuff so it looks like we may have a happy marriage there where it works of being able to create new shallow water habitats that actually purify our water even better than used to we're going to see, uh, but that's where people's minds are going now in terms of how do we adjust to this terrible crisis and threat of sea level rise.
there's thousands of miles of shoreline around the bay and the idea that we can build a levee everywhere and have a bathtub bay. Uh, first of all, we're talking probably trillions of dollars, so the mm -hmm. cost is enormous, amazing. But the impact to our aquatic environment will be devastating because again, if we just have a bay with steep sides, we're not going to have uh, oysters and shellfish and crabs and fish and birds. We're just going to have a piece of the ocean, which will occasionally have fish, but not tons like we have now. It's not going to be the same place. It will be much less alive and it will have significant impacts up and down the coast. So well, and also you, you know you're talking about, but but I didn't know, for example, until very recently that there's sturgeon in in the bay. Sure. So and that that's incredible. I mean, because yeah. I'm Russian, you know, so so sturgeon is very popular in Russia. Uh, but also we have we Caviar. have huh? caviar. Oh, unfortunately. Sorry, but. <laughs> Well, it is what it is. Uh, different, it is, what it is. different, different, different places, right? Yeah. Um, but also, we have we have dolphins. Um, we have uh, um, we have um, what is the the biggest creature? We have sea lions and harbor seals and whales now coming whales, in. Yes. So we have people coming into the bay several times with babies. Right, so it's uh, which, of course, we we have to have bay protected, and uh, I was I was also devastated to know how many uh, whale deaths uh, caused by ship in this. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, that was a uh, crazy that they they died in in you know tens uh, and dozens you know, so in a day. So this is so exciting, actually. I agree with you also that sometimes na nature cleans better than what we come up with because our, yeah. our, our uh, facilities, especially when we have huge influx of water and rain or uh, snow melt, a lot of times, I don't think a lot of people know that a lot of times untreated water actually does go into the bay and into the ocean. So I think that, that that's that's something that people need to know and need to understand that when that water goes into the bay, marshland hopefully help to at least absorb some of the chemicals and toxins and pollutants. So it, it has a huge implication for our health and people are now still fish in a bay. Um, so, so for some people, it's it's really a source of food. So we have to be very conscious about that. So, um, thank you. And, and I know that you were on a, a huge project. I don't know if you're ready to talk about that or it's a little premature, but involving agencies and governments because this is without involving them in this work, it's really hard to get um, it, it moving because we need to. Um, Governments, local governments don't understand that we can actually travel building right next to the shoreline. But by the way, you want to talk about it a little bit because that's an interesting project. Yeah, uh, I mean, sea level rise is not a mystery, uh, a secret to you know our mm -hmm. our agencies that work around the bay, the Bay Conservation Development Commission our Regional Water Quality Control Board, our U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, all these, all these folks know about it. Uh, I mean, the state has done a really good job, our Ocean Protection Council, of identifying the threats and uh, identifying ways to respond to those threats. Uh, they've done really, uh, really good work. Uh, BCDC has just released this report on adapting to rising tides 2020 that talks about all the impacts that we are facing. I mentioned some with the 80,000 homes and the hundreds of miles of, of roads, etc. But what we do about it is more problematic for those agencies and where we are at present within the Bay is that 
it seems from this report from uh, the Bay Conservation Development Commission and this new project, they're moving forward to come up with how do we address what the report tells us we have to address, is a heavy reliance on local governments knowing best. Mm -hmm. And while local governments play a critical role in how we live our lives, local governments and local office holders are looking at what affects them particularly. And most of them, if not all, will be thinking, uh, we need a seawall. You know, I mean, the bay's rising, and yes, we need our shallow water habitats, and yes, we need, uh, you know, to think about the bay and its health and our environment, but not here because I've been elected by my community and, you know, and so it's, and then it's understandable. It's totally understandable. And you want them thinking that way or else you wouldn't be voting for them to <laughs> govern your local community. But when you're facing a regional crisis like this is, and this is actually an international crisis. I mean, the Bay Area is uh, internationally important in terms of its aquatic habitats and ecosystems. But, uh, because this is not the first time you're mentioning that, can you just, because I want to know what, why, why is it internationally important? I mean, I, I know that it's also, I mean, we have major ports, San Francisco and Oakland, but, but aside from that, why, why do you see it? As a well, for example, oh, 20 years ago, the, uh, what it's called the Western Hemispheric Shorebird Reserve Network. <laughs> it's an organization. All those things in mind. What? <laughs> Sorry. what can I do? Uh, but this is an international organization that works on uh, following and trying to keep our world's global shorebird populations alive. And uh, there have been reports lately, shorebird populations are plummeting with climate change. I mean, it's one of those things. And uh, if you think that the world can live without wildlife and nature, then that's fine. But if you recognize that things really do all connect and that we really do have a connection to nature, it plays a role in keeping our lives place peaceful in our lives. I mean, we, we breathe oxygen that trees and, and wetlands and, and, you know, plants produce. Right. So this international organization, Western Hemisphere Reserve Network, identifies crucial areas for shorebirds. And we fall into the most crucial wow. category. We are a you know, we, we write at the top in terms of habitats. This is San Francisco Bay uh, mm -hmm. for shorebirds, migratory shorebirds, because of the huge number that come here and either stop to feed on their way north and south, in their different parts of the migration, or just reside here over the winter. They breed up usually in the Arctic and then migrate down to southern South America for feeding during the winter and then migrate back up millions and they come here and they're not going to come here if we drown all the mudflats which is where they feed but this organization identified them as us uh, we are the place of international significance for sherbets and similarly for uh, waterfowl uh, I mean, we have huge populations of waterfowl come here. So in the natural world, we are internationally significant. Renowned and important. That's right. yeah. so, 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 going back to, so going back to the local governments and how they're responding, they respond as you might expect they would. And so let me take... 30 years ago when the bay, or well, this was the 1960s, the bay was totally polluted. People were putting landfills into the bay. We were filling the bay. There was a proposal for the Army Corps to just completely fill the South Bay for housing until there was just a stream going through it. The response to that was the creation of the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission, a statewide agency that regulates what you can do in the bay. Can you fill it? Not easily. 
Can you put a <clears throat> disposal site in the bay? No, not at all. Uh, More, right. disposal. So it took a regional agency to stop. We were filling the bay in 1960, which may seem a long time ago, but it was not that long time ago. Uh, and we've lost around a third of what the bay used to be to landfill. Mm -hmm. And it took a regional agency to say no, you know, we're yeah, going to say what you can do. Something. It's, it's, I would argue, that. and I want to really point in that it took people like you, people who recognized the importance before anybody else did, and did everything they could to to contact others to make sure that not only communities but also elected officials and and uh, representatives understand the importance of it so so nothing really happens if you see those beautiful places and you think oh that's here. everything i know about bay area and actually uh, in a lot of places in the world the open spaces that we see are preserved because of activists like you. So I just wanted to, to make sure that people understand and get active. So if you're passionate about something, get active because we do need help protecting those places I, still. So Arthur, but I want to make sure that, that people <laughs> hear that. So the agency was formed to protect the, the Bay and then yeah. that work. <laughs> And, and you're absolutely right. Uh, the conservation, BCDC as it's called, Bay Conservation Development Commission, was created by the public. This was not out of, there was this huge campaign as people, I mean, back then people did not want to go to the Bay. It smelled because raw sewage was being dumped into it. Uh, garbage was being dumped into it. It was an unpleasant place and people sort of turned their backs on it except for a couple of women in Berkeley Mm -hmm. Three women in particular who got together and said, this is intolerable. We need to do something. And it caught fire. There was a, a, a radio uh, person who had a talk show who took this on as a campaign. And it just grabbed everybody's imagination because it was such a disaster in the Bay. And, and this commission was ultimately formed as a result of that. It didn't come out of some politician's head or some agency's head. It came out of public protest and determination to have our base saved. And those and those women were the founding, uh, founding leaders of uh, uh, the Bay. Of Save the Bay, that's right. Yeah, which carries on that tradition. Exactly. Um, and so we need another movement like that for sea level rise because Local communities are not going to be able, first, they won't have the money, most of them, and two, they won't have the ability, really, to, to take actions that might not please everybody in their community, because there's no way that we are not going to escape some pain. I mean, this is a world in protest against us, and the idea that everything will be wonderful in the future, uh, despite this and nothing will change, it's, it's not going to happen. There's going to be significant changes. Mm -hmm. People will be affected. And what we need to do is make sure that impact is reduced as much as possible, that the disadvantaged communities, because a lot of them are on the shoreline, mm -hmm. are given the help they need, because they certainly won't have the uh, financial ability to address this, whether it's moving back from the Bay or putting up a living shoreline or uh, whatever, it's going to require a community approach. We're all going to need to work together to make sure that we keep a healthy bay, keep our world healthy so that we can continue to survive as people and make sure that those who are least able to respond to it are given the means to do so, whatever that is, whatever, the re proper responses. And we need some kind of regional perspective to help people decide what those right, those regional responses should be so that communities are protected to the degree they can, but that the Bay is also 
kept alive and well, and that our living earth continues to be a living earth. Uh, all of that is going to take an incredible amount of work and uh, it's going to take a regional perspective. It won't happen city or town by city by town. And right now the processes that have been going on, we've had great studies that show what's the problem. We have a process called they adapt that saying we're going to work together to come up with solutions, but their solutions are all local. Mm -hmm. They're not looking at regional, some kind of regional governance, which really I believe you ultimately need like BCDC an agency that says, no, you can't build on the shoreline here because it's going to be underwater. So why would you want to build there? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I very happy that you have the, the depth of the knowledge, but also the breadth of, of vision to, to work on that. I, I, I'm very happy that, that you're looking at, at that. And, and also, I think a huge part of it also, um, we just had a panel actually discussion yesterday with some Sierra Club leaders talking about approaches to approach. I hear some when I'm speaking. Can you hear me clearly, Martha? Mostly. Mostly, yeah. I, today's, I don't know what's going on with our connection, but you know, those of you who are watching us, apologize if we, if I'm sounding a little bit unclear, but um, it is Zoom, you know, virtual world. <laughs> um, so, so we had a discussion yesterday um, about um, educating elected official, uh, officials and the importance of that. Um, that that we cannot expect them all to be specialists like you, or, you know, the people in environmental issues. Um, and also, we need to educate communities and empower communities for themselves because more more people understand what they really do. I think they get more empowered to to speak for themselves and and to articulate issues and ask for resources, which is incredibly important in that. And I think that's yeah. what we're still um, doing. And I hope that Sierra Club will continue to do that work of educating. Well, here, here I was wanted to talk to you about your personal you know, story. And we ended up talking about, <laughs> about the marshlands, which is, you know, I, I'm assuming that's what keeps you up at night also thinking about strategies is that, a correct assumption yeah uh it, it certainly is and uh, i guess for me uh sea level rise has a particular impact because as you said at the beginning i have played a role in again with many others but i have played a role in preserving a lot of wetlands around the bay mm -hmm. and they're all going to disappear with sea level rise so everything <laughs> i've worked on so I'm making it just personal. It's all about me. Uh, <laughs> Almost, there's a lot of personal. I mean, it, it, and it should be. You know, if it's not personal, but Mother Teresa said that I, I uh, won't do anything for the masses, but I will do something for one person. And I'm paraphrasing, but the meaning is there. So we have to be passionate to, to work. Yeah. So, yes. Thank you for being passionate about that and taking it personal. It's important. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, that's that is a driving force. And you know what people can do as uh, I'm hoping the club helps lead an effort to push towards this regional recognition of a regional need to address this issue and not leave it up to individual local governments. Um, we'll be asking people for their support and writing letters to their politicians and our going to uh, the Bay chapter of Listserv, uh, where we'll be putting up requests for people to sign on to petitions or calling somebody or just writing a letter. Boy, nobody writes letters anymore. And email. Um, video if you want to, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there will be things that people can do to help address this sea level rise issue in all our communities and we'll let them know mm -hmm. well 
thank you, Arthur. And we definitely will be playing major, in, if, you know, you play a major uh, role in that on behalf of the Sierra Club. So thank you. And but I, I want to sort of go back a little bit. We we almost at the end of our, our hour, which is unfortunate because I actually I could I could have that. I mean, I'm sort of geeking out a little bit on the whole biology, <laughs> you know, conversation in nature so tremendously interesting to me personally but you also you know you have a family you have granddaughter from uh, what i know and and the, how what kind of conversations do you have with her and other young people so and what kind of what are you sharing with her and with others to how they can contribute beyond, um, beyond politicians um, and is she involved actually in this, any environmental protection or not well i don't know that uh she's involved she's uh very interested in politics and uh, and strong feelings about the democratic uh primary issue i mean she's fun to talk about she's 17 um when she was five years old, we took her down to Martin Luther King uh, Regional Shoreline Park to look at wetlands and birds and have done that very infrequently. Uh, but she herself has gotten more and more interested in nature. So that's been really pleasing for me to see. Don't talk a lot about conservation. I do enough of that outside, so I don't do a lot of it in the family. We just do family stuff, which is, uh, Wonderful in itself. Do you, uh, you also garden, right? Pardon? You also garden? Oh yeah, we garden. My wife and I, we have, uh, we're fortunate to have a garden. We live on Petrero Hill, so we have a lot of sun. We grow tomatoes, other vegetables, beans and stuff. Well, it's very helpful right now. The what? It's very helpful right now in our, uh, we have some spinach growing. So we have a green to eat, don't have to go to the store so often. Spinach is very good for you. I'm making very my healthy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we still bird a lot. We go out birding and uh, close to my home, I can walk down to the bay and see ducks and geese and shorebirds and other water birds. It's it's, uh, you know, it's a great feeling to connect a little bit with something that's not just us in the bigger world. Nature. You know, somebody was speaking with my friend and we both noticed that this year that we hear many more songbirds. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it may be more tuned or if it's because of the, because I know that noise from freeways and planes affect songbirds tremendously. So um, I, I noticed um, difference uh, definitely. And, and also, you know, I hope you go, I hope you go to build a little bit more habitat, but still I went there with my friend also socially responsibly <laughs> with masks. In our distance. Exactly, but so beautiful. I mean, we are blessed, of course, that we're in the area that, and I'm sorry if anybody is listening to cold climates, but count your blessings and make sure the closeness to nature is one of them, for sure. Right. Um, anything that you would like to share that I didn't ask you, but you would want to share with people? Um, well, seems like we've been pretty encompassing, I guess, um, you know, as we're stuck at home for at least a couple, I mean, who knows how long, um, it is a good opportunity to, for example, go to your Sierra Club webpage, wherever you are, mm -hmm. and look for how you can, you know, contribute to the activism we need to keep our world alive and well, and, you know, Put your name on petitions, uh, sign on to letters to our legislators and to Congress. I mean, those are the kind of things we can all do. Mm -hmm. And it does have a meaning. You know, I used to do a lot of work in Washington. Uh, I've also been, I've been chair of several different entities that work nationwide. Mm 
Mm -hmm. uh, mostly with birds because I started with birds. We'll have to do another interview. We have to do another conversation to talk about all of that also. But, you know, legislators in Washington do look at, you know, even an email signature where they see millions and it's maybe not the same as a direct letter or a phone call, but it still counts. They still look at it. It adds up to the, oh, this is what people think. And that influences what they do. So you do have a voice. Everybody has a real voice. I absolutely 1000% agree. And I'm working in the, in the local government and it's absolutely true on the issues, especially the issues that are um, not as straightforward and, and controversial sometimes. Or, I mean, to us, it seems no brainer. It's not no controversy, but they are still, because you have to balance the many interests um how many people write and call and email really does. so i i totally second you <laughs> action or it's absolutely important right. yes you know? we all play a role that's 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 very true and in sierra club is definitely expanding the region and um it's easy to get involved also so so do go to sierra club uh, website and you can get involved in any um, sort of on any level with any issue. You can contact me and Arthur. Yes. <laughs> and Arthur, like, thank you so much. We are actually looking for, for people joining the club and joining this issue of level horizon and, and uh, protection of our base. So if you're specifically interested in that, please, you know, please contact us because it's absolutely. It's and we want to make sure that we're building the bench, and especially if you, um, you know, have knowledge in, in uh, bay preservation, that would be amazing if you if you contacted us. It's been an amazing time. I, 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 you know, I want to know more about your work in Washington. Your musician, your uh, drive is just a, it's a very robust uh, history. I, I really love. Hearing all of them. I would love to see you play basketball. <laughs> Do you stay still play or? Um, no, I sort of stopped around three or four years ago and just got oh. too busy doing this stuff. And I used to be really good and I'd pick it up and I wouldn't be quite as good as I used to be, and it was frustrating. Well, let's let's get back to it. I want to eat <laughs> <you know, Jim. laughs> Right. Thank you so much for your advocacy. It's been a pleasure and I love working with you because you always bring a balanced approach, very thoughtful, very knowledgeable. So, and, uh, and you work well with people and you really the justice and, and inclusive in, in the forefront of your mind. So I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Olga. And likewise, it's, it's really great working with you too. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, please join us every Friday at noon to get to know our wonderful Sierra Club and other environmental leaders from the you know, Bay Area and the world, um, a better place for all of us, protecting places that we enjoy to visit. Thank you. Bye.